Welcome to the podcast recording of Middle East AI News Live for Thursday, March 14th, 2024, brought to you by Carrington Malin, Marketing for an AI First World. You're listening to my discussion with Pavel Cech, co founder of New Native, the global AI ecosystem, where we talk about Saudi Arabia's generative AI startup accelerator Gaia, how the program identifies the most promising AI startups and the recent 72-hour AI hackathon, which took place at Leap24. In today's Thursday Deep Dive, we're going to be talking about Saudi Arabia's generative AI startup accelerator, Gaia, the fastest growing AI startup program in the region. We'll touch on how New Native empowers Gen AI startup, the new paradigm that it aims to harness Gaia's accelerator program, the 1 billion ecosystem funding announced last week, and Gaia's process and how it validates AI startup concepts. And I'm going to be joined by Pavel Cech, co-founder of New Native. Pavel Cech is one of two founders of New Native, a new type of AI-powered company formed in 2022 to power the AI native economy. New Native's AI platform brings together the latest AI technologies, allowing businesses and users to develop AI solutions and distribute them at scale. The company was named AI Startup of the Year 2023 at the Europa's Tech Startup Awards last year. New Native now has a large global community of AI developers, which is able to focus on key business challenges and actual challenges via hackathons. And Pavel himself is a serial entrepreneur, has worked in the US, Asia, and his native Poland. So a warm welcome to Middle East AI News Live, Pavel Czech. Hello, Carrington. It's a pleasure. Hopefully uh, you can hear me well. Very well. Thanks very much for joining. Great to have you here. Thanks uh, for making the time to join us and look forward to talking about New Native and the Gaia Accelerator Program in Riyadh. Saudi Arabia's Minister of Communications and Information Technology certainly caught everybody's attention last week at LEAP with a presentation that included billions of dollars of deals, investments and programs. And one of these is $1 billion funding announced for the AI startup system, which was attributed to the success of Gaia in his presentation. And as a result, Uh, The government is investing in data, infrastructure, partnerships with AWS, Google, NVIDIA, Aramco. So recognition at the highest level for a program that's not even one year old yet. To set the stage, perhaps it'd be great if we could start sharing more about New Native and the drivers behind you setting up New Native and how this led to the partnership with Sadaya and the NTDP. Could you start by telling us a little bit about New Native and how uh, this developed? Yes. So again, thank you very much for the invite to the show. It's an honor. And thank you, everybody who's joining us and listening. It's it's lovely to to have you. New Native as a concept, as an idea, was born as as a way to accelerate innovation, right? We had this need internal, this this intrinsic motivation to get us from A to B a little bit faster and a little bit more effectively. How I see it is that when the tide rises, right, when the water goes up, all the boats go up together. And I think that's what the paradigm shift of artificial intelligence brings, is the ability to have an increased collective impact in a a positive way, right? So some people talk about the era of abundance. Some people talk about more opportunity. I think it's very important to focus on quality of opportunity which doesn't necessarily mean equal outcomes, but we should invite people in. So that's how New Native started as an idea to to invite people to join the paradigm shift of artificial intelligence. And I always worked on a large scale on digital transformation, first in the education industries and then in AI and biotech industry. And for me, it only makes sense if it can impact tens of millions of people and ideally hundreds of millions of people. So in order to do that, you need to have the, the will and you have to have an idea that there will be a force behind you. You can't do it alone, right? So that's how we started to invite people to join us for Hackathon. How we invited, started to invite people to join us to build together because that feeling of empowerment, when you come together and build something, I think it's, it's, very, it's very important to people. I always say that building makes us stronger. It's like the, the spark of creation, taking something out of nothing. And regardless whether it applies to writing a song or a poem or a novel or, or 
participating in interesting conversation, it can also be attributed to creating code and products and companies. Yeah, that feeling of creativity. And that's how new native started is how do we accelerate collectively um, humankind uh, in, in a direction that has positive outcomes for, for more people? So how do we take that acceleration and make it more inclusive, more equal? So we started an online platform called lablab.ai. And on that platform, we started to onboard people to use every new technology that came out into the market. We started to engage with big AI labs like OpenAI and Cohere and Stability AI and AI21 and Google and all the other labs and then technology providers. So fast forward, it's turned into a community of over 110,000 AI builders and I think about 90 technology partners. Most of them are multi-billion dollar brands and companies. And this, this movement that is being created, right? This grassroots innovation movement has got the attention of people that have a vision. And I think definitely Saudi Arabia is one of those places where you can say, hey, there is a vision. So that's how we got interested in Saudi Arabia. I can tell you a little bit about how, how it all started. So we, we set up New Native as that company to empower acceleration and innovation using artificial intelligence and set up the first online hackathons and invited people to join us. And fast forward in... 20 months, we have 110,000 people that decided to participate. So it moved extremely quickly. Uh, obviously, technology is moving extremely quickly. There's always new technology coming out in an extremely rapid pace. So that's one of the things that we specialize in is how to capture technology very, very quickly and then build out a functioning piece of software. So as an example of this at LEAP, you know, there was a big conference, obviously, you know this, but maybe our listeners don't, big technology conference in Saudi Arabia. And we were invited by NTDP and Sadaya to run a hackathon there. And in 10 days since we started, we managed to invite 4,700 people online, a few hundred people offline, and in 72 hours, they created 90, 90 functioning products. So that just is a testament of if you get the movement behind you, you can accelerate the, the outcomes. So I think that's kind of our core, core work. Yeah, certainly it's a great uh, illustration. Obviously, you have challenges in mind that you're trying to solve here and, and make things easier and more efficient for people developing AI models and, and product. The, the one of the number one concept is that people need to find like-minded people, right? So the, the first thing is that it's difficult to find people that are interested in the same things that, as you are and that are building things on the same level as you are and that are willing to try things and fail. So we invite people to build together. We help them find the teammates, the partners. We give them access to the resources. So as an example for this recent event, OpenAI partnered up with us to distribute $100,000 in credits for people to build cool stuff. We also had partners like Vectara and some other partners that gave us resources for the builders. And then we have a whole set of tools that help people build faster. So a co-pilot that helps them to curate the technologies that's built into the, the platform. We have mentors that are both online and offline that connect with people. And we orchestrate the whole process to a, a successful conclusion. Yes, and, and that's a, a lot of traction in 72 hours last week with the Leap Hackathon. <laughs> a lot of traction so let's move on to Gaia Gaia begin as a conversation or a phone call or you know did you visit and and, and then that sparked something actually an amazing story in my mind uh, because we were invited to speak at a, a conference in Riyadh called Rise Up and I was one of the speakers uh, there on stage and I effectively being on stage uh, allowed me to get a forum People were interested in this message of equal opportunity and decentralized access to technology. At the time, as an example, this was probably in, in December 2020. OpenAI APIs were not available in Saudi Arabia. Only until Gaia came into 
the, the country that they were made available. But so this idea of having a global community that accesses technology to build innovation uh, in a rapid pace, that, that was very attractive to the officials in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Specifically, one person can be attributed to the success, which is Ibrahim Nias. He's the CEO of MTDP. He listened to the talk and, and, in, and invited us for breakfast. From a perspective of three months, I think, we went from a breakfast meeting to a signed contract. So if I, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen a, a government move quicker than that in my life, which was fascinating to me. It just shows the, the interesting energy that, that you can find if you find the right people. So very, very quickly, we, we had a contract ready, announcement was ready, and we immediately got to work. So we launched our first cohort in end of June or early July, 2023. And from then we managed to execute three cohorts, as you said, total 48 companies. And yeah, it was, it was actually lightning fast. Yeah. So thanks to the leadership there, we set very clear goals. And when we started, some of the technologies didn't even exist that the companies are using right now. So when we started the program, Autonomous agents were just emerging. Large, large action models were just emerging. Data pipelines such as RAG didn't exist at the time. So we knew that there is a direction that technology is accelerating towards. And we knew that with the right support, globally, we can capture that. And uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has a keen interest on supporting that global success and supporting entrepreneurs. So that's how it started. Certainly a groundbreaking initiative, and for this reason, regions really opened a lot of people's eyes to what's possible and, and, and highlighted the interest from uh, local and from global developers. So there's a big announcement last week about His Excellency Abdullah Raswaha made about a billion dollars funding based on the success of the program so far. And we spoke last week and a lot of details were still in process. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, the announcement was extremely exciting. It's, it's very exciting to be mentioned in such a setting. Also, I want to add that two companies from Gaia, Agile Loop and Optimal BD, were also mentioned in that announcement, right, as uh, examples of success. But there's 46 equally impressive companies in that mix. So the announcement was very exciting. Whenever such a big number comes up, the details of that are, takes a long time to establish. So I can't give you specific numbers about allocation, to verticals. What I can say is that it's a number that represents commitments to the ecosystem, and it is designed to support not only the Gaia Accelerator program, but also the infrastructure, I mean compute infrastructure that's needed to attract entrepreneurs, but that's also needed to make entrepreneurs scale and succeed. So it's around model training, but it's also around model inference. Right? So it's about both creating the specific integrations between models and data sets, or even uh, building models from zero. Uh, but it's also about the ability to then run a persistent product. So a product that continues to deliver value to the, to the client. And that requires even more compute. So that amount represents the commitment to the companies, the infrastructure, the training infrastructure, the inference infrastructure, and finally, mm, the ability to attract extremely high quality talent that is needed to make these very early stage companies then su successful and, and scale. So what I can say is that there is a plan, right? And that plan is to make, to have new native be the number one place for people to build with AI. and for Gaia to be the physical representation of that message in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And in order for that place to be the number one place in the world, a lot of things need to come together. A billion is a large number, of course, but there are other announcements all around the world made every day, I would say almost every day now, that basically tell you that the number one investment direction is artificial intelligence and the artificial intelligence ecosystem. So my belief and my hope is that the commitments, the size of them and the direction will only grow. So I believe this is an amazing step and it shows that Saudi Arabia 
has a goal to be one of the biggest winners in, in the digital transformation that AI promises, but for sure it's not enough, right? It, it has to be even more, not only money, but also it has to be um, more actions. It has to be regulatory change. It has to be IP protection. It has to be legal uh, frameworks, right? So to make such a change in a country is very difficult. I think Saudi is uniquely positioned to make that change and therefore can actually you know, have an equal seat at the table with uh, global superpowers towards artificial intelligence infrastructure. I can only agree. And it's a big vote of confidence, confidence for the startup ecosystem in Saudi Arabia. It's also a clear signal that we're not slowing down. This is going to go, continue to go very fast. And we're going to continue to build new ventures, continue to build the infrastructure and the uh, resources that we need to meet our goals. But let's just divert a little bit from Dyer and, and, the, and that billion dollar announcement. In the region, a lot of investors have been sort of ambivalent for a few years about artificial intelligence. And they do have uh, some challenges, as they do anywhere else in the world, investing in, in AI. And a key one that keeps coming up is validation. You know, how do I know that what I'm investing in is actually what needs to be created is, is a useful AI model, AI solution that is going to stand, stand the test? And of course, it, it's only very recently we've had this big increase in resources in terms of AI specialists and data science professionals and uh, people that uh, have experience of building AI models. What do you see are the key challenges for investors? And uh, do you see, have you seen a change in views in the last year since you've been engaging in the region? The simple answer is yes. The change is clearly visible. I approach the whole idea of using capital to create an outcome or leveraging capital to create outcome from a slightly different perspective. We're very technocratic, so we don't really look individually at, at, at people. I, maybe that sounds bad, but we rather look for signals, for signs that a specific uh, team can deliver a functioning piece of software that can be turned into a product that can then create and deliver value. I think the way that we build and operate software has drastically changed already, and it will only continue to change. So the perceived value of a PowerPoint presentation with a great team behind it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a great investment anymore. The promise of functioning software is not enough. And I'll explain why a little bit. So the amount of capital that was needed in the past to reach a certain stage of development was, was let's say, $5 million on average to reach a certain stage of product market fit. Today, that barrier is significantly lower because people can utilize very advanced technologies and the very, very advanced AI systems to create the same back-end, front-end product and then determine product market fit with a fraction of the capital. This means that legacy software, and you might have read this in the Wall Street Journal, legacy software is going to be devalued. And to give you an example, with uh, the most recent announcement from Klarna, they worked on creating an AI agent that takes care of their first-level customer support. That agent does the work of about, if I'm not mistaken, 700 people. Now, what is the impact of this? For Klarna, is obviously better productivity, better customer experiences, lower wait times, more revenue potential. But the call center company that was providing services to Klarna lost, I think, $1.5 billion in value in 24 hours. So what does that tell us? is that investors are used in the past to a specific type of business. And that business, that business utilized capital to achieve a certain result and then return a dividend or return value to the investor. With AI technology, the amount of capital needed to achieve the same result is drastically smaller. And I think that especially in the GCC region, in the MENA region, investors are very quick to, to acknowledge a paradigm shift because they are less, less attached to their portfolio of legacy software 
that is getting basically written off. That whole asset class of legacy software is getting destroyed in the next few years. And I think the investors in the Middle East are less attached to it and more prone to try out new things. So that's my experience so far, yeah, that, that investors are very interested to try out new things and that they have a good understanding of the amount of capital that's needed to achieve a result. They're really price sensitive. Yeah? So it's not like Silicon Valley valuations. They're, they're saying, you know, oh, great, this is a company that's valued at 1.4 million, 5 million, 2 million, whatever it is. But it's not a ridiculous valuation for what they have achieved so far. So I think that creates a unique opportunity for founders because they can come with a functioning product that they own 100% of that product and that company, and they can very quickly attract smaller tickets from local investors and get much further with those smaller tickets than they would in the US. So can I ask you, should uh, investors take confidence from the startups that exit the Gaia program for future investments? And why should that be? What's the, the, the process and the, uh, the reason that you're able to produce startups that are, are viable? And at the beginning of the, this the process with Gaia, it was a very ambitious target, 300 new startups mm -hmm. in three years. And a lot of feedback I got from AI founders and sort of startup community was, how would you produce that number of startups of quality? And of course, now we've seen in the last three cohorts, the demo days, a very high quality of startups that have come out of the program. So what can investors take from that? I think you have to be ruthless in your assessments. You have to be extremely clear not to make exceptions. Yeah, whenever we make even the smallest contingency or exception, it, it always is bad. I think the core is that you have to be true to your core values and to your core convictions about how technology works. And, and if you stick to those convictions, you have a clear vision of, of that, then you can select people that are very technically driven, very motivated to prove to themselves and then ultimately their shareholders that the thing that they build works and functions and they continuously deliver. So how should investors feel confident about it? At the very worst case scenario, at least the product works. At least it's a fully functioning product. So I think what we focus on is to have no doubt towards the, techno, the technological value of the founders and the ability of the founders to create products that are very advanced. So we focus on that almost exclusively. And so far, as you said, the quality of the companies is, is very good. The quality of the product. So maybe it's just an old saying, you know, product first. Maybe that's, that, that's just what works. But in today's world, it means that you need to do extreme due diligence on the quality of the work of the founder. And I think that's what we do at Gaia, right? That's our core component is that we stick to our core values and our convictions around the thesis of picking founders and companies. And as we pick them, we never pick people that don't have uh, great technology behind them. And whenever we did one or two of these exceptions for a variety of reasons, it, it just proves the point yeah, that, you, that we shouldn't derive from it. Then whether it's a good business, yeah, whether the business will make money, whether it will create lasting shareholder value, I think that can only be proven at later stages. Please remember that we are focusing on extremely early stage founders and companies, right? Pre-seed companies, seed companies, almost from an idea phase to a functioning product. So the, the hackathon platform must be an enormous asset in this then? It is, it is. It's completely, it's, it's a big, big megaphone. And if anything else, if you're listening to this, just Google AI hackathon and you will land on lablab.ai as the first organic result. Yeah. That's true, I think, for every country in the world. And we constantly are on the leading, you know, edge of the sphere. You know, we're the tip where we're literally the ones that are always saying, let's try something new. Something new comes out. Let's try it. Let's see if it works. Let's see if people are interested in building with this. And this is how we can remove the signal from the noise because there's so much stuff going on that if you don't know which technologies 
can function in a production environment and which ideas can function in a production environment, um, you will not know uh, which, how to conduct your due diligence. Perhaps, Harvold, you could tell us about putting together the cohort to begin with. Does that all come through your hackathon platform? Uh, no, people are welcome to join the ecosystem at any stage of their development. So they're not limited by the stage of their idea or product. The Lab Lab platform, specifically in the case of Saudi Arabia, what we did is we launched the first hackathon, physical one, in the innovation tower at Cax. So big thanks to the team at Cax to, for hosting us for almost uh, half a year and then the team in the garage hosting us for the last three, four months. So what we did is we invited about 1,600 Saudi developers to join us on this first journey. And out of those projects, we picked about, we created, I think, 100 or almost 100 projects in 72 hours. Then that was in May. And we picked seven to join the cohort. So out of the first 15, seven or eight came from the hackathon and the remaining seven or eight were external. And that is more or less the ratio that we stick to. Yeah. So we, we have probably 40% of people coming in from the hackathons. And then the remaining people are people that are inspired by the journey, but they have already started to work on something and they are slightly more advanced. And obviously we don't want to make it unfair. So we don't include them in the, the hackathons if you already have built something we want to make it super fair, super transparent for people. So a continuous inflow of projects. And then we do a very robust, very specific selection process. And then a very small percentage of our applications uh, get through. And we focus on working with those teams directly in the Gaia program. Great. And these I think first hackathon that you hosted in Saudi Arabia goes back to last March or April, didn't it? It's, it, it was May, I think. And, and that is when the program started. So the first hackathon, then it was about a month later, at least, until the program started. Because the hackathon results in projects and teams. And then obviously you need to recruit the remaining teams globally. And then, you know, the legal registration of the teams, getting all the paperwork in order, signing all the term sheets and all of that. So that, that requires a lot of time and effort as well. Right. And then the first cohort ran over the summer then. Correct. It was very, it was very warm in Riyadh. I can tell you that. Yes. I can tell you that it was, it was scorching hot and we worked with the teams and the teams worked probably 18, 20 hours per day, every day for 10 to 12 weeks easily. And, and they came out on the other end, I think extremely happy and extremely successful. So it's like almost like a seal seal type program, right? We we take no hostages, we we negotiate with nobody and we you know, we make sure that people get their stuff done on time and on deliverable. And so you just had the demo day for the third cohort, I believe. So yes. you've run three cohorts now, one over the summer, I think the other October November. Correct, October November and then from uh, beginning of December to effectively end of February or mid-December to end of February. So it's a it's a 10-week sprint each time. Yeah. Is it possible to give us an idea of the the type of startups and also the variety of startups that you've had through these three programs? What are some mm -hmm. examples that you could tell us about? Sure. So I can tell you straight away. So that, that's a very, very good question, by the way. So the types of startups, we almost exclusively do not engage with people that are building wrappers or so-called wrappers on top of very popular models. We knew very, very early on that that is a, a type of company that will be very quickly excluded from the market. So I'll give you an example like uh, Jasper, which was a big, big deal at the time, right? One of the first investments made based on open AI API access. And when ChatGPT came out with uh, the agents embedded, basically that company and companies that are similar had no reason to exist anymore. So we, first of all, we, we don't pick companies that we see as having no future based on technology. Just purely, we exclude them because the type of technology or the application of technology is not something that we see 
will be uh, usable in the next two to six years. So that's the first exclusion metric. And then the inclusion metrics are connected to the use of data mainly. So how does a team integrate data use and proprietary subject matter expertise into utilizing either open source or commercial AI models? So that's the second group. So people that are using proprietary data sets and proprietary subject matter expertise to build uh, products that solve specific problems. And then the third bucket are people that are working on deep tech solutions. So people that are building and writing their own algorithms and proprietary um, uh, software sets that are completely detached from the current available systems, but they use an underlying architecture that we can understand. So they either use, whether they use reinforcement learning or they use transformers architecture, that's our third bucket. So we don't look at their verticals so much. So we don't look at whether it's medical or aviation or retail. We don't really focus so much on, on, the, on the UX and the UI of the systems. Because again, that is something that AI is now taking care of almost fully and in a dynamic way. So we look at their competence to connect data with AI systems that are on the market or to build proprietary AI systems. Those are like the, the two main buckets of expertise. I don't know if that's maybe a too technical answer. Uh, no, that's perfect. Thanks very much. And what are the, the results in terms of the types of startups and examples that mm. we could, might relate to over the past year? Sure. Sure. So, I mean, one of the most recent examples is Scythe Check. So these are two female entrepreneurs, founders, that created a proprietary algorithm that they coded start to finish that allows to determine so-called model bias and model drift. So if you... Again, this is a slightly longer conversation, but I can just redirect uh, somebody to listen to the head of AI at Meta about his views on models being very, very localized. So a model that functions on a data set in, in Germany is not the same model that functions on a data set in Saudi Arabia or Abu Dhabi. And SiteCheck allows users and enterprise users to determine whether a model is getting biased or it's drifting from its core functionality. So think about it like an insurance policy, right? That you would buy. And whenever somebody says, hey, your model is not representing me correctly, or it's not representing the data I gave it, um, SiteCheck would come in and say, no, no, this is like what happened. This is the reason behind it. This is a graphical representation of how to fix it. So a stark example of this was the recent Google situation with Gemini, right? Which we, I think, all know about. And that's an example model drift that is based on biased data set that is used to run it. Yeah, The model itself isn't inherently bad. It's just that it got connected to a data set that directs it to a certain outcome. So that's an example. That's a very deep, very complex uh, algorithm. Uh, another one... Uh, that is from cohort one, let's say, uh, is an example of uh, a company that I mentioned before that was on stage, Agile Loop. Agile Loop creates a new type of transformers architecture and now moving to a more advanced architecture, but I am not at liberty to say because it's quite, quite groundbreaking research, actually. But what they do is they utilize your computer, your existing software, to empower it with AI actions. So think about it like, like using an LLM right now. You put in text and you receive text. And in Agile Loop software, you can go to their website and see it. In Agile Loop software, you put in an action that you want to receive and the model conducts that action. So it knows what is the software on your computer and can utilize that software to, to get a specific uh, result, if you wish. Yeah. So I think that's, those are two great examples. I have, again, 46 other examples, all connect, either connected to very, very deep tech or new uses of artificial intelligence. And there are some great examples of commercial products, yeah? 
products that allow you to create a full movie script with the action boards, with the characters, and basically allow you to create a full vertical model that is only focused on entertainment industry. So that's an example of a data connection to the model, not creating something completely from zero, but creating a new model that is hyper-local. And the hyper-localization comes from the proprietary data set that they have access to. And I think the best way to experience this is either go to Gaia on LinkedIn or on Twitter or on the gaia.newnative.ai and actually look at the videos from the demo day. Because if, if I would kind of mention all the companies, we would probably need another 24 hours. Yes, absolutely. Because there's so many. That's uh, the point, right? That's the point is that there's so many, but they are all great. And this is what's, you know, I'm, I'm surprised myself a little bit. I wasn't expecting that our results will be so high quality. Out of 300, I was expecting three maximum. That would be stellar. And I think we have a lot more. Yeah, sounds like it. If we have startups listening and they want to understand what your process is in terms of application and selection and onboarding and how the program rolls out, could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So effectively, it's all as everything that we do at New Native is systemically driven by software. We don't, we try to avoid manual processes and human interaction. <laughs> Again, as weird as that sounds. Because we can't help everybody if we, if we have that very, very personal relationship. So there's a website that you go to called gaia.newnative.ai. And there's a big green button on that website. And you click the button and the system guides you how to conduct everything. And then there are in-person interviews, but there's a lot of background work being done by our proprietary AI systems in terms of checking code checking markets, checking um, the market entry mechanisms, and so on and so on. So we built a lot of proprietary systems that um, help us to manage such a large-scale process uh, more effectively. But that's the only thing that you do. Like, whenever I meet somebody, I say to them, you have to follow the process. I can't help you individually. Nobody in our organization can help you individually. As long as you follow the process, then you will get a full very transparent action set and, and replies. Right, understood. And then once you're accepted to the program, then you know, what, are the, what are the next steps? First of all, you're invited to come and visit Riyadh. That's the number one, yeah, in terms of Gaia in Saudi. We are launching the accelerators all around the world. So our goal is to have at least 10 locations in the next 12 months. That's kind of our big, hairy, audacious goal. And I hope we get to do it. But you're invited to work with your fellow with your fellow participants. So it's again like a SEAL Team Six, right? It's a, it's misery and pain and just staring into the void and eating glass for ten weeks. And uh, yeah, so that's what you got to look for. Uh, obviously, you get resources, support, uh, access to the biggest technology partners, the biggest AI labs, the best experts in the world, people from uh, you know. People from the biggest AI labs, uh, like we had a, uh, people from Cohere fly into Riyadh to join the hackathon to support the teams, right? As a good example. So you get all of the support, you get all of the family, you get all of the community and the distribution across this community, but you also get a lot of pain. And so that's kind of, that's, that's the sweet and sour mix that we serve once you get accepted. <laughs> well, everybody's been warned. Yes. And I say that to people, by the way, like I actually warn people and then somebody says and comes and complains or says that, you know, this is hard or, you know, this is difficult. And I said, yeah, exactly. Welcome to the party. This is a Saudi program, but it's open to participants from around the world. How mm -hmm. does that work? We, thanks to NTDP and Sadaya and our partners in the Saudi government, we have this privilege to invite people to actually register either their full company or their regional headquarters in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So that gives you a lot of privileges like access to the market, access to grants, access to additional programs, a lot of benefits that were announced even by His Excellency Al Swaha recently on stage, access to the capital that is uh, available in Saudi Arabia. So you anybody in the anybody anywhere in the world is invited to join, please join. 
you're welcome uh, to, to come and work with us directly in Riyadh. We help you with everything. And obviously, like any country, there are difficulties. Yeah? If you want to start a company in Germany, you still have to go to the notary public and you have to sit in front of a person and sign a piece of paper. Not the case in the US, not the case in Singapore. Still in Saudi, uh, it's somewhere between Germany and, and Singapore. So it's not perfect, but it's, it's actually getting a lot better. And the, the willingness to support AI founders and AI startups is just through the roof. So definitely there's a lot of incentives for people to come and, and build their business for GCT or globally out of Saudi. If I could just clarify, so if I'm a, a startup that is based in Europe, say, and uh, I'm mm -hmm. interested in this program, I can apply and I can come to Riyadh, I can take part in the program. But in order to actually graduate the program and receive any funding, I need to be registered in Riyadh or in Saudi Correct. Arabia. Uh, and then this is something that, it, that a lot of assistance is provided by the government and by Gaia in order to make that easy to do. That's that's 100% correct. And obviously, it's it's depending on the stage of your company, you're welcome to register fully from zero if you don't have a company in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Or if you already have an existing company, you can place your regional GCC MENA headquarters in Riyadh. And, you know, there's a lot of incentives to eventually uh, invite you to move your business over there. But we don't, it's, it's not a, it's not a obligation. We need to round off now. Any final comments? Yes, we are looking to speak with anybody and everybody that is on the bleeding edge of innovation. Yeah. So whether you're building something for edge, edge compute use cases, or you're building something very advanced in code automation, or you're building something that I have never even imagined in my life, you should definitely come and, and apply and talk to us about this. And second of all, I think this is a, a movement, a global movement that I would like everybody to feel invited to. I just want to say to people that it's okay to try and it's okay to fail and it's okay to try again. So please do that. Please join us for the events coming up on lablab.ai. Apply for gaia.unative.ai. And uh, together we can definitely make a difference and, and build a better future for everybody. So that's the, the message that I want to leave everybody with is that it's a very positive outcome, very positive outlook, and we can all look forward to it. And, and I hope that you decide to build it together with us. That's it. Thanks, Pavel. This has been great. Thanks very much for joining us on Thursday Deep Dive and talking about uh, Gaia and Unative. Uh, very interesting. Definitely uh, look forward to bringing you back some, some day in the future. A big thank you to you and uh, Middle East AI News. Thank you for inviting us and, and me. And great conversation, by the way. Great questions. I, I feel very uh, passionate, about, passionate about this. So I'm happy to, to chat to you at a time where we have even more announcements, you know, cohort four is starting right now. The applications are open. So I, I, I hope that I will be back to you with another 20 to 25 companies in the next maximum two, three months, and they will be amazing success stories as well. So thank you very much for the invite. Thank you. Looking forward to that. I've been talking to Pavel Cech, co-founder of New Native, the global AI ecosystem behind Gaia. Native is changing the way that the world... You've been listening to a recording of Middle East AI News. Live, for Thursday, March 14th, 2024. Brought to you by Carrington Malin. Thanks for listening.